Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is another privilege for me, under God, to welcome you on today's broadcast. I want to thank God for your life and I want to appreciate the goodness of the Lord and the faithfulness of the Lord to us all. God is good, God is faithful, God is powerful, God is merciful. None can ever be compared to Him. Let me welcome you on today's broadcast and I'm trusting that it will be another time in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of this weekly broadcast known as Navigating Life Through Grace. Thank you, Lord Jehovah, for what you have been doing. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for reaching out in grace and power, understanding and revelation to everyone connected to this broadcast. I give you all the glory. Today, Lord, I ask that the Holy Ghost will take over and the mind of the Father will be revealed, the counsel of the Father will be established, Jesus will be glorified, and everyone connecting to this broadcast will be instructed and edified. Thank you, Father. I give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let me welcome you once again on today's broadcast. Today, by the grace of God, I am continuing in the series of teachings that are started in the last eight weeks, titled Barriers to Spiritual Growth and Maturity. It is another dimension of truth in continuation of the general theme that we are considering, which is the imperatives of spiritual growth and maturity. Holistically, Spiritual growth and maturity is a deep subject, and week by week we look at the different dimensions of truth so that we can have complete understanding of all that we need to know about spiritual growth and maturity. The teachings I am continuing today is actually a 10-part series aimed at revealing the barriers to spiritual growth and maturity, and specifically I am considering the Barriers to Spiritual Growth and Maturity, Part 9. These barriers are practical, personal manifestations of the flesh, otherwise known as the carnal nature, that I have seen physically demonstrated in the lives of many believers. At the end of today's broadcast, I believe that no believer should be in doubt as to what constitutes a barrier to spiritual growth and maturity and how it can be surmounted. I am confident in the Holy Spirit that this aspect of the truth about spiritual growth and maturity will deepen your personal yearnings from, for growth and maturity in the Spirit and will undoubtedly strengthen your resolve to effectively participate in God's end time agenda. So I'm looking at barriers to spiritual growth and maturity Part 9. The eternal purpose of God on the earth can be speedily manifested and ultimately fulfilled if believers are experiencing spiritual growth and maturity. This is because believers are the voices and representatives of God on the earth. The intensity of divine operations in a generation is a direct function of the spiritual sensitivity spiritual sharpness and alertness of the believers in that generation, which in turn is directly connected to spiritual growth and maturity. As believers, we must intentionally close the gap between what God is willing and able to do and what we are actually witnessing by passionately pursuing and consciously pulling down every barrier to spiritual growth and maturity. To achieve this, we must first identify the barriers. As long as these barriers are not identified and prayerfully dealt with, spiritual growth and maturity can never be a reality. Strong local churches and effective pastoral leadership and supervision are critical factors that aid spiritual growth and maturity. However, the final choice to grow is a function of the individual's believer's readiness 
to faithfully and humbly deal with these spiritual growth barriers in his or her personal life. Without brokenness and diligence in this direction, spiritual growth and maturity will be impossible no matter how spiritually strong and conducive the local church atmosphere is and how effective the pastoral leadership and supervision are. Beloved, it is important to state at this juncture that the flesh is a major barrier to growth and maturity in the spirit. The flesh is the greatest liability in the quest for spiritual sensitivity and spiritual maturity. The flesh is always a notorious barrier between you and God, between you and God's purpose, between you and God's voice, between you and what God wants you to have, to become, and to know. The flesh is a willing tool in the hand of the devil. The devil always needs the flesh to manifest and operate. In other words, the presence of the works of the flesh always provides the opportunity for the oppressions and manifestations of the devil. Once the works of the flesh are properly curtailed, the devil has no opportunity to operate. Therefore, victory over the devil can never be guaranteed until victory over the flesh is secured. Friends, the flesh is that part of you that argues with the words of God, that disagrees with the laws of God, that opposes divine counsel and purpose. The flesh is the natural training that your body had received to disobey God. The flesh is the old man, the eye in you and the sin in you. According to Romans 37, verse 17, the flesh is the carnality in you, the selfishness in you, the lust either for money, for food, for power, sexual immorality in you. The flesh is the malice and the bitterness in you. The flesh is the offensive and revengeful tendencies in you. The flesh is the proneness to rebellion in you the stubbornness in you, the disobedience in you, the pride in you. The flesh is the covetousness in you, is the hypocrisy in you. The flesh is the people-pleasing tendency in you. The flesh is the man in you that hates the truth and those who tell you the truth. The flesh is that part of you that hates to be controlled and regulated by the word of God and by the Spirit of God. The flesh always wants to do, to say, and to eat what he likes. The flesh always wants to be flattered, to be praised, and to be called what is not a reality. The flesh is the natural tendency in you to love pleasure more than purpose. The flesh is the natural tendency in you to love indolence more than industry. The flesh is the natural tendency in you to love indulgence more than discipline. The flesh is the natural tendency in you to love form more than form, spiritual form. The flesh is the natural tendency in you to love carnal frivolity more than spiritual reality. Romans chapter 7 verse 14 to 25 is a summary of this description. And I read, Romans chapter 7, verse 14 to 25. The Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am kinda sold on the sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. 
for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me to captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Brethren, until the flesh is put to death, your spirit cannot be free to connect to the word of God and the spirit of God in a way that guarantees spiritual growth and development. There are ten practical personal manifestations of the flesh or carnal nature that I have seen physically demonstrated in many believers in my 29 years of pastoring in the local church. These carnal barriers can never accommodate spiritual growth and maturity in any believer, regardless of years of church attendance, except they are dealt with. Having shared the first eight barriers in the last eight weeks, which are carnality and frivolity, lack of contentment in God, selfishness, negative thoughts, rebellion against the truth, Number six, shallow lives devoid of godly example. Number seven, misplaced spiritual priorities. And number eight, controversial personality and wrong attitudes. Today, I shall focus on the ninth barrier to spiritual growth and maturity, which is love for leadership title above leadership life. Love for leadership title above leadership life. Brethren, have not seen what will stop a believer from growing and maturing the spirit more than love for leadership title, more than leadership life. Quite a number of people today want title, but they don't want the life. They love leadership title above leadership life. There is a leadership life. That's the reality that can bring growth and maturity into your life. One of the major hindrances to spiritual growth and maturity is the foolish preference and passion that most believers are manifesting for leadership title at the expense of developing the leadership life. Therefore, the spiritual lives of majority of believers in our generation appear very massive but regrettably lacking spiritual substance. Their lives look very impressive, but unfortunately lacking spiritual depth and spiritual strength. The believers' spiritual lives today appear very large, but sadly lacking spiritual solidity, lacking spiritual ruggedness, order, and precision, characterizing the life of an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ according to the New Testament standard as personally stated by Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62. I read, and it came to pass, that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nest, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go beat them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man. Having put his hand to the plow and looking back, his feet for the kingdom of God. Furthermore, as a result of the grace for leadership title, the believer's spiritual life today appear to have some form of godliness or seriously lacking in spiritual power and expression. 
So most of the time, what most believers parade today is just a show, a show, a show, not the substance, not reality, just a show. The believer's spiritual life appears very loud, charismatic and big, but in reality, very empty, very useless in most cases, largely deficient in soberness and godly character, and very feeble spiritually, very frail, and very weak. Beloved, let me state very clearly that the road of leadership life is indeed the road of spiritual death. The road of leadership life is the road of thoroughness. The road of leadership life is the road of attention to details. The road of leadership life is the road of critical substance. It is the road of spiritual sensitivity and alertness. That is what you get when you pursue leadership life instead of leadership title. And you can't be getting all that I've been mentioning without growing spiritually and maturing in the spirit. The road of leadership life is the road of spiritual ability and availability. It is the road of spiritual determination and poise. You don't see a man that is following the road of leadership life give up easy. It is the road of spiritual creativity and competence. That's the road of leadership life. The road of leadership life is the road of spiritual character and godly example. That is what makes up for a complete and authentic leadership life. Instead of the grace for leadership title. Furthermore, the road of the leadership life is the road of spiritual capacity and discipline. You cannot be pursuing leadership life without increasing in capacity and discipline. The road of leadership life is the road of spiritual wholeness and hard work. Many people today pursuing leadership title have fragmented lives. You can't see integrity in their life. You can't see wholeness in their life. And a lot of them are very lazy. The road of spiritual, of leadership life is the road of spiritual submission and faithfulness. It is the road of spiritual service and loyalty and the road of spiritual brokenness and godliness. These critical qualities are what comes into the believer's life when he begins to pursue leadership life instead of leadership title. And you cannot have this array of qualities in your life as a believer without growing and maturing in the spirit. Sadly enough, very unfortunately, beloved, very few are walking on this road. Why? Because of its narrowness, because of its treatness, and because of its godly qualities. The Bible emphasizes in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13a and 14. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13a and 14. The Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Why? Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And regrettably, beloved, few there be that find it. On the contrary, the road to leadership title, listen to this very carefully, is the road of eye service and flattery. The road to leadership title is the road of spiritual shallowness and lack of substance. Most people pursuing leadership title today are flattered people. They are shallow people and they lack spiritual substance. That's why they will never grow and mature, even though they carry title. The road to leadership title is the road that makes the so-called believers to be very empty spiritually, but very loud naturally. Very lazy spiritually, but very wealthy materially. Very dull spiritually, but very smart physically. And very powerless with God, but very popular with men. It is the lower road, that is the road of leadership title that many people are walking in today. Is the lower road that makes believers to be lacking in spiritual sensitivity, in discernment and alertness. You can never see anybody that is crazy for leadership title have spiritual sensitivity. 
They will lack spiritual sensitivity. They will lack spiritual discernment and alertness. But very highly suspicious, politically current and correct, and socially acceptable. That's the road of leadership title. It is the road of no character, no godly example, but long-term church membership. It is the road of ego. That's the road of leadership title. Check it out. Those who are pursuing leadership title in the church are full of ego. They just want to boast around. They are arrogant. It's the road of position. It's the road of power. It's the road of manipulation. It's the road of undue influence and recognition. The road of leadership title is the road of undeserved honor and respect. It is the road of popularity and prestige. It is the road of no spiritual encounter but religious experience. Unfortunately and regrettably, majority are walking on this road. Why? Because of his satanic generosity, demonic freedom, and ungodly compromise. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13b, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there. Brethren, this explains why authentic spiritual growth and maturity is hindered in our day. However, it is important to note that the practice of the early church and the order of scripture is that there must be a life before an office or title can be acceptable before God. It is leadership life that brings credibility to leadership title. Leadership title without leadership life is empty, godless, frivolous, and demonic. It is leadership life that confers acceptance and genuineness and authenticity to the leadership title. It is the life that confers spiritual validity on the title. This is because when the battle of the title shows up, it is the life that can successfully secure victory in God. In other words, when the shallow, shadow of the office or the title is lifted, God becomes interested in the substance of the life as specified by Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. Let me read it. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. It's the account of how the early church considered those to be to fill up vacancies of those who will be distributing food to God's people. You will see the emphasis is more on the qualities of the spirit in their life, more than the title they carry. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Christians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitudes of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God as our tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of what? Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. Can you see? More of the leadership life instead of the title. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen. Here, the quality of Stephen. Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, because the right people are in the right places. Those people who are having the mantles are at work, instead of those people that are carrying the title. The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith, you see now, and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. The kingdom result of spiritual revival, growth, and maturity and effectiveness in the things of the spirit, seen in verses 7 and 8 of the scripture that I just read, is because leadership life takes precedence over leadership title. Regrettably, 
the reverse is the case in this end time. And it explains the sudden disappearance of the critical side of Christianity. We have too many people parading titles today with no mantle, no grace, no growth, no maturity, no development. It is only life, the leadership life, that guarantees your growth and maturity, not the leadership title. In most of the churches of the end time, more people are occupying the position they have no character and integrity for. In most of the churches of the end time, more people are occupying the office they have no spiritual maturity for. In most of the churches of the end time, more people are carrying the title they have no mantle for. In most of the churches of the end time, more people are occupying the seat they have no life for. And more people are occupying the place they have no spiritual purity for. This is a direct and unfortunate violation of the sacred scriptural order of leadership life before leadership office or title as clearly revealed and reiterated in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 13. I leave you to read the whole of that passage, but let me highlight a few verses. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a, faith, a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desired a good work, but above desire. Above the grace for the title, this is the life that, us, that sustains the title, that confers authenticity on the title, that validates the office. A bishop then must, there is no negotiation, must be blameless. It's either you want it or you don't want it. Otherwise, you'll be a caricature carrying a title for which you are not, you are not, you are not mature. For. Must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. Apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a broiler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So you see, in the heart of God, it is more of leadership life, who you are, not the office you occupy. Who you are, first and foremost, not the roles or the activities you engage in. That is the priority of the kingdom. And it is that priority that guarantees growth and maturity in the spirit. Friends, as we choose the road of leadership life above leadership title, we are spiritually trained. When we choose the road of leadership life above leadership title, we are spiritually tested, we are spiritually nurtured, we are spiritually developed, we are spiritually upgraded. As we choose the road of leadership life above leadership title, we are spiritually prepared, we are spiritually matured, we are spiritually strengthened for transparent and godly example, and we are spiritually equipped for effective kingdom service and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. As I conclude today's broadcast, it is important to understand that the church or kingdom title that you are craving for or fighting for in the absence of authentic character and life will ruin your spiritual capacity for growth and maturity and totally destroy the purpose of God for your life. Stop chasing title and start chasing the spiritual qualities and life that qualifies you for your prophetic mantles and your prophetic portions. This is a critical target that directly empowers you for unending spiritual growth and maturity. Let me remind you of the nine barriers to spiritual growth and maturity that I've shared so far. Number one, tonality and frivolity. Number two, lack of contentment in God. Number three, selfishness. Number four, negative thoughts. Number five, rebellion against the truth. Number six, shallow lives devoid of godly examples. Number seven, misplaced spiritual priorities. Number eight, controversial personality and wrong attitudes. And number nine, which is the one I just shared today, love for leadership title above leadership life. Next week, by the grace of God, I will conclude my highlights of the barriers to spiritual growth and maturity. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, I thank you for these truths and for the lives of everyone connecting to this broadcast. Lord, I pray that you will shape the understanding and the life of everyone according to the truth of today's teaching. Help every believer in Christ to know that it is wisdom to pursue spiritual growth and maturity as the primary goal of the Christian life. Help us, O Lord, to deliberately and continually align our hearts, minds, and lives with the truths of the Word of God as we intentionally develop the spiritual discipline of chasing the realities of leadership life as we seek to grow and mature in the things of the Spirit. Help every believer to deliberately cultivate a broken and contrite heart that trembles at the truth of Scripture. Help every believer to pursue becoming everything God ordained them to become as the main motivation for living. Thank you, gracious Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Wow, it is always a pleasure sharing fellowship together with you and sharing fellowship together with the Holy Ghost on this broadcast. And I believe it is worthwhile. Till next week when I shall come again to a fresh edition of Navigating Life Through Grace. Let me counsel that to grow and mature in the spirit, you must pursue leadership life above leadership title. Don't be titled crazy. Don't chase after the nothingness of title or chase after the substance of life. It is leadership life that enhances development of spiritual qualities that make you grow and mature into God's purpose for your life. It is well with you, Jesus. See you next week by the grace of God. God bless you.